and welcome to Jason and Bart Show, where we discuss season agency operations. Can you tell I've done this before? <laughs> this, that was very smooth. It is very smooth. I'm not cutting this out because, you know, this is our first episode about agencies. I think we're going to talk about agencies. Jason, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I'm Jason, and I'm here to talk about agencies today. No, Jason Rosenbaum. I'm currently senior partner and chief operating officer, a 30-person boutique digital agency called Crowd Favorite. I also run, as founder and principal, a consultancy providing finance and ops consulting for small business owners and entrepreneurs called Wheelhouse Advisors, and been doing this for about 15 years now. And we're here to talk about agencies in case you missed the like, beginning. Like you haven't missed us. We're going to talk about agencies. Right. <laughs> anyway, I'm Bart. I work on Sumo Heavy Industries. We're an e-commerce consulting firm. Been around for about 12 years. There are about 30 people together spread out all over the place. Jason and I actually had this conversation about this particular topic in Orlando in... Instead of riding the rides at Universal, we decided to walk around and have some beers and talk about operations and how things work. So this is coming from that. I think that's right. After we important. after we figured out like what the per what the per person like revenue for the park was per day, and like <laughs> that's what right. That all worked out. Like, that's like, what we this is how our about, brains but, yeah. work, right? Like this is the idea of like. We figure out how, how things work and, and what's the, the best way to efficiently, you know, make as much profit for an agency as you can, right? I think that we did like that. Some people were like, bar. I think I think the two of us figured out like the opportunity cost of waiting two and a half hours to ride the ride to Hogwarts pretty quickly. <laughs> right. Chose, or, chose a different um, path. <laughs> yeah, we did. We did. We actually had a good time, but we met we, a while We had some back, duff beer. Uh, we did get tough beer. Ooh, I forgot about that. Yeah, we did. But we met a while back. I think Orlando was the first time we actually met in person, I believe. In person, yeah. Maybe you're wrong. Um, so Jason and I are, are Jason is a lot better at this than me. I'm just piggybacking off of him because it's fun. But we've been running agencies for a while. This is company number six for me. And, you know, we started as nothing, just a development shop and figured out how to do you know, got screwed very, very badly. This was one of our conversations that we did um, the first year of business. And we kind of dug ourselves out of that where we became consulting on retainer basis, which is, was crazy 12 years ago. And now I'm here more and more of that. So that's kind of our little bit of story where we got to operations. And that's kind of what I do for the company. Jason, you do that for, for both of them, right? And you consult with agencies to do this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, crowd favorite originally, you know, I'm a partner at the Velo Media Group and Velo Media Group owns some of the company, some other companies and crowd favorite is one of them. And when we integrated essentially three companies into one company in 2014, like the, the operational complexity, you know, tripled overnight, introducing two brick and mortar cult of personality cultures into a completely distributed, rather structured, not so flat, a structure was definitely interesting. So a lot of lessons learned early on and, you know, it's, it's, it's these systemic things that allow a lot of these owners and entrepreneurs to take their talents and actually grow a business that's sustainable over the long, over the long term. Right. I see that a lot now working with a lot of our clients at, at that wheelhouse. So. Yeah, I mean, we're both part of the Bureau of Digital, which we know has a lot of agencies and we know a lot of friends and, you know, it's fun to watch sort of operations and kind of glean over what's going on. And it's funny because 12 years ago, I didn't have any of that. You know, you kind of learn as a fly and figure things out. I had few friends that were agencies that we kind of glean over and actually got help from them. But having the Bureau was like a big, big shot and like having to be able to just call up anybody, right? When did you, Before, when did you start? like interacting with them so the bureau actually started around in philly so i know a lot of people from there like a lot of people that have been like around Greg, you know happy cog is yeah. one of the the big companies that started it and that's a philly company that's been around yeah. no longer a philly company but you know took iterations in it so i know being around philly tech community you kind of run into all of it, everybody mm -hmm. so like one of the people that's been around forever is will from Seer interactive 
that's how I met my business partner because of Will and I will for a very long time. And it's, it's the same thing with Happy God, you know, I knew Greg for a while too. And we were a tiny company. I couldn't, <clears throat> the way they started was the whole idea of, was it 10 people and a million dollars in the revenue or something like that? When you first, they did the first the owner camps and stuff like that. So they had a little bit of a restriction for it till they did the owner summit, which was everybody, which was great. Um, that was my first like in person been to all of them, mm -hmm. love them, love just the community of it. Yeah, I think that's where I got involved. It was like 2016. And it, I think it was in Atlanta it was the first owner summit I went to. No, ma no, actually, I think the first event I went to was in San Francisco. Might have been 2015. Summit, the first but, one was in Austin. Yeah. And then there was another one in Portland. My partner at Crowd Favorite, he and actually one of the owners of the companies that we had acquired James Archer, who was part of 40 at the time, he was already in the bureau and that's how we got introduced. And then Kareem and James attended, I think, <laughs> an event in Portland and said it was pretty good. And that got me to go to it, to uh, San Francisco for the next event. And of course, you know, just, it was great. It was both validating on the one hand, because, you know, you're always kind of like, oh my God, I'm kind of like you, you said, you know, you're sort of gaining experience and flying by the seat of your pants and trying to make the best decisions as you can, especially early on when the company is just still very immature. So on the one hand, it was very like, oh God, you know, like I'm going to take, take, take from this, you know, I have nothing to add. I'm screwing everything up. And like, I'm just going to like <laughs> take from the experts. And then I think it was great to get there and be like, oh, like lots of people share the same challenges that I, that I'm going through right now. So some people have and had answers. And I think some people are really, I like the part where you work through it with somebody who is outside of your organization because they don't come with all that baggage where they can't see the forest or the trees, you know? Um, right. And it's, it's funny because the, the, you, if you look at over the years, like the, some of the topics, right. The, the bit, one of the biggest topics is value per, pricing, you know, value based pricing and everybody had in the argument. And the funny part, but to me about that whole conversation is that everybody has taken it into in a whole bunch of different ways. Right. Like we're fully retainer based. we have a specific way of doing work. You know, there's hourly, yeah. there's projects and stuff like that, but you can glean over little tidbits that you can implement into your world that work and work for you. It doesn't have to work for everybody, right? Like I always say like retain a way the way we do it is awesome. I hate hourly, but if you're going to do hourly, go with Rob Har from Sparkbox and talk to him about it, how he does it, because I love how he does it. You know what I mean? There's this whole bunch of like little things, tidbits and all the time. So that kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think what's, what's great about being part of these these networks and these communities is you, you stay very up to date on the issues and topics that are facing, you know, these owners and entrepreneurs on a daily basis. But also right. when you look at it over, like, you know, I started the first, or I was partner and CMO at the, my first startup, or the first startup, like the late two thousands. So right when the financial crisis was, was going on. And it's interesting as you follow over time, the ebbs and flows of different environments that you're operating your business in. Right. And, you know, I, you, you, we've been at it for a while, but I wouldn't say that we're like, you know, we're not like old seasoned, you know, guys for like 50 <laughs> no. years or anything like that at this point. So, but it's interesting in like the, the 10, 15 years that, that a lot of us have been sort of you know, a lot of digital agencies kind of spun up in the mid two thousands out of like right. enterprises, getting rid of developers and just being like, I don't even know how to manage you get out of here. And people are like, Oh, right. talent is out on the market. And, you know, but it's, it, I think it's super interesting currently coming out of, I mean, obviously coming out of pandemic, but the current climate that a lot of these agency owners are facing right now is it's, it's such an interesting combination of like, there are such unique dynamics in the marketplace right now, but also if you do your homework, like you can see patterns and, and there's some historical repetition going on here as well. And so, you know, right now things that we're seeing, right, like we're, we're seeing in, in a lot of the channels that we're in is, is around pitching too. It feels like there's kind of a K shaped recovery out of COVID within the agency yeah. space too. You kind of have either like, let's say like a third of the companies are, they crushed it coming out of the pandemic mm -hmm. and they can, they're continuing to crush it. They figured it out and, and whatever. And you probably have like a third who are in the middle. They're teetering. They're like, we did okay. We survived. 
but like, I swear to God, if another black swan event comes tomorrow, like they're, they're it's over. Like I get, and that's how the owners right. feel. Like I can't possibly go through something else, you know? And of course you've got like a looming recession and all the biz dev repercussions of that. And then it seems like you've got like a third of the owners out there who, who they just didn't make it. And like, they're all trying to run for the consolidation Hills. So Jason, let's talk about like, sort of what the industry kind of looks like. I mean, I feel like it's like when we started our agency, you know, it's going to be a lot more people starting agencies coming out of big companies. You know, I think the weird, I think to me, one of the weirdest things is all these companies hire all kinds of big, big people, big sort of hired a whole bunch of people that the, the stuff skyrocket like crazy when it comes to salaries. And all of a sudden I think they're starting to lay people off and I think salary is going to come down. Yeah, definitely the labor market is going to, I think what's so interesting about the last few years is just like, you know, you thought things were moving fast before and now it's like, they just, they've just hit the fast forward button on the fast forward button. It seems like, like we were just having conversations about bloated salaries and labor mark labor markets and working remote and hybrid work and, and in office yeah. and all, all these things. And now very quickly, the worm is turning, right? As fast as it, as fast as you had those issues, now you're dealing with the other side of those issues. That's the craziest part to me. It was like, was it April, May, we were talking about all this stuff nonstop where like it's bloated yeah. and people are going to other companies and because of, they're getting money. And all of a sudden, like on a dime just went, well, people are starting to refocus stuff and start to lay off things. And you're watching this and you're like, it's like a weird, I've never seen this like on this dime. I don't know if it's just because we're so close to it and, and see it from, from bigger companies, but it's interesting how that all of a sudden just changed. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, I think for us, especially on the small business end of things, obviously we're, we're a lagging sort of indicator, everything kind of flows yeah. to us last. And so I think what's interesting is in the beginning, the labor market was so strong because obviously there was a lot of, there was a lot of supply, there was a lot of supply of jobs and right. And a high demand mm -hmm. for skill sets and, so people could kind of pick and choose exactly how they wanted to sort of navigate their professional development and so on and so forth. And I think what's happened very quickly is the market has it, and is in the process of changing. And I don't think overpaying for labor is necessarily the issue that most owners and operators have to deal with. Like if you hired somebody six months ago and you feel like you overpaid, like compared to today, that may be true, but compared to that moment, it may not have been true. And I think with hiring, you kind of have to yeah. stay kind of to stay in the moment because you're trying to bring in the best talent, obviously. And, and, and look, if you're dealing with a small business, let's face it, you know, all of our resources are essentially limited, right? So we're doing, we're trying to get the, the best we can, the best bang for our, for our proverbial buck. Right. I think it's going to be really interesting to watch how people and how owners and operators maneuver through the hiring process over the next six to 12 months. I think you've got, you had a lot of like big companies, especially in tech, in the last few months have started to lay people off. We're seeing kind of this 10 to 20% across the board. Mm -hmm. Most of it is most of it is just kind of marketing bloat, it seems like, that a lot of these technology companies kind of added. That's where they're going first. Like I don't like I saw an interview with Satya Nutella at Microsoft and he was like, he's like, Yeah, do I think people are gonna cut? And are they going to be a little bit more careful with how they spend? Yes. Do I think that they're going to cut, you know, enterprise digital transformation? No, I don't think that's where they're going to cut. They're going to find other places within the business to cut. So in some ways, I think the digital agency space is in a really, let's call it recession resistant, not recession proof. Yeah. So in that regard, I think they're in, they're in good shape. I was talking to an owner out of, he's based in Austin. They just went remote in the last couple of years, but he was lamenting to me in a conversation we were having, you know, like he lost a senior backend Drupal developer to Apple for like, I don't know, it's like 175 grand a year or whatever. And like this guy's yeah. running a 50 person agency. He's doing very well, but like, you know, he's not, not going to pay. That's not where their salary bands are for a senior Drupal developer. Right. And he was yeah. like lamenting, like, oh my God, like, oh, you know, 
how do I, how do I do this? Like, I just thought to myself, like, it's a great opportunity. I would spin it. You can market your company as a stepping stone. There's nothing that says that, you know, our companies are the last place everybody is going to work forever and ever. And certainly if you can start to position yourself and, and really focus in on a demographic from like an age perspective that you're looking for or where somebody is in their professional journey, and you can be a stepping stone to bigger and better things. I think that's a tremendous PR opportunity for a lot of, for a lot of agency owners. And they look at it kind of the downside, like, oh, I can't keep my talent. But the reality is, is if you market the fact that your talent is leaving and go on to bigger and better things, you're actually going to wind mm -hmm. up attracting the next wave of talent behind that talent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I think it's a little harder when you have senior management, you know, that's so ingrained and so in there where, and nothing against developers, it's, it's more of, you know, it, it can be, you know, their talent, pure talent or development is, is what their skill set is, but they, you know, doing a process for a new company is not hard once, once you do that, right. Whereas senior management has been there forever and they actually do the process and they put all that stuff in there. When somebody like that leaves, it's a little harder to play with. Absolutely. I mean, and, in my opinion, and of course, I that... mean, I, I can see, I mean, I can see one of our people leaving and then, you know, that's going to be a little devastating. Yeah, but, but that's always the risk. You know, we were talking about this the other day internally about mm -hmm. like, why do people hire a crowd favorite? Well, like they like the fact that we're small and we're agile. And we, you know, we're not too stuck and we can kind of be very nimble for them. And of course they like the fact that I'm sure comparatively to like the big players in the space, we're probably very affordable and all the rest of it. But they also don't choose the crowd favorites of the world for the same exact reasons because of the size. And I think one of the things that we were talking about the other day, you're talking about sort of how do you avoid being held hostage, right, by your... Mm -hmm. by any employee, let alone your, your sort of management team and the people who are handling a lot of the day-to-day, -day, a lot of the relationships, have a lot of the institutional knowledge behind the yep. services or the product that you're delivering, you know, and that comes down to, you know, that comes down to, you know, an excellent documentation process and a real willingness, I think, in the onboarding process to not just sort of learn learn academically from what's been documented, which is important, of course, but there's this mm -hmm. idea of mentorship that if your company can sort of instill in its operational processes, that may make those transitions a little less disruptive. They're going to be disruptive. You're a 30 person company, you know, you lose two people. I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot, especially if they're, yeah. they're sort of at the fulcrum of, of what you're doing. Yeah. You know, for us, project managers, tough. I mean, right? Project managers right. have a ton of. Yeah. I mean, for us, even being at 30, we're, we're kind of running a lot of projects and, you know, we probably should be like 50 or 60 easily, but uh, you know, the way we kind of run everything and, you know, we kind of have people move around the projects all the time. So they understand what's going on because then you have, listen, you have, we just dealt with maternity leave and vacations and people being sick. And, you know, you kind of have to go through that moment of, of movement, which is fine, which is, you know, part of the life. Like I look at some of the conversations and I'm like, this is just business. You know what I mean? Like as much as I treat our employees really well and they're awesome and, you know, we're, we have a good sort of culture internally and in a day, you know, you still, you're still an owner, right? I feel like you're still working for them, bringing everything in, you taking all the obstacles away, but you, you, you're in that business. Like this is business, you know? Yes. It's my life. It's kind of crazy, but you know, people will leave and it's not, end of the day, they're not owners, right? which is just part of, part of this life. And I think you learn that over time. I think you've got to go through some of the, you have to get some of the scar tissue of whether it's clients or it's, or it's your own staff, you know, there'll mm -hmm. always be someone who will leave who you're like, oh man, I really liked, I really liked that person. I liked them here or that client was great. You know, we were such a good fit for each other. It's too bad that, you know, but what you realize is these things have a shelf life and, sure. you know, staying, I look, I, there's a lot of talk about like, oh, you know, the old school way was just treat your, treat your people like line items. And the new school way is treat them like anything but line items. 
And I think that there's, to your point, there's a happy medium in between where, again, I, I think you do too. You just mentioned it. I think, you know, we both believe in servant leadership that the leadership gets a lot more back from the team, the more that it gives to the team. And we talked, you and I talked the other day about the difference between being, being a boss and being a leader and all that stuff, but you're right. I mean, you're there taking is a, as there a, is as a fine line there. Right. I mean, as an owner, you're taking all the risk anyway, right? Like I sign every single contract every sure. signed by me, right? I take, that's my neck on the line. As much as, listen, our employees are amazing and awesome. We have a great time with them, you know? There's that whole overarching, like, there's a business side of this, you know? And then the other day, like, listen, I trust them wholeheartedly, but we make money from clients doing work for them, right? So mm -hmm. everything else is is just, that's the job. You know, the job is to deliver it to the client. My job is to and, make sure. And you just hit the nail. Yeah, you just hit the nail on the head. That that's the job. I think. I think what I see sometimes is we. I don't know if we've gotten away from the expectations of what it is to own and operate a, a business. Right to your point, it's ours. Like you can't have the expectation that an employee is going to care as much as you do. No. You know, when you wake no. up in the morning, it's yours. When you go to bed at night, yeah. it's yours. It's not theirs. It's still yours. They yeah, are I mean, my, doing my, you a right. favor by giving them your time. Now you are giving them money for their time. That is that exactly. is the technical relationship between employer and employee, right? right? But to your point, you know, you want you want to do everything you can, and it's a it's a it's a comprehensive approach that does it. You can't just be like, well. I'm going to make everything great for the person to pump out as much code as they can possibly pump out every single day because I'm going to give them the fastest machine they've ever had. And like, you're like, okay, that's part of what's going to get them to pump out all that great right. output. But there's a lot of, there's a, there's softer skills also that go in or softer mm -hmm. leadership that goes into, to your point, I think you called it removing obstacles. Right. And those, yeah, can be I mean, it's removing obstacles. Hard and soft. Yeah. Right. It's remember how it's, it's it, multiple ways, right? The job is to remove obstacles from, from doing that. So if they need a faster machine, great. You, you figure out how to do that. Right. But there's the other side yeah. of it, like pay attention what's going on with their life, especially after COVID and through COVID, right? Like pay attention what's happening and, and check in with them. Have those soft yeah. skills where it's like, Hey, what's going on and not be, I don't know. I sometimes see this weird hard line where it's like, just be human, <laughs> just be a person. Like, I don't know. I have this, like, sometimes I, I watch things and I'm like, why, why be so complicated? You know, like in running the business, it's not really that complicated. Yes. It's hard. Yes. It's hard to be yes. a small company and selling to big businesses and all that kind of stuff. But when, when it comes to this, it's like not really that hard. And listen, I've had my own, you know, and the way I look at it is that, you know, I just went through a whole bunch of stuff and my team had my back completely. You know what I mean? Like I never had to worry about it, right? They did their job. They're doing what they did. And in reality, they've taken obstacles away from me to do what I had to do, right? Like it's, it's, it's a weird sort of backwards way of doing, but I'd take away all their, like whatever they need. I take all the obstacles away as much as I can, right? It's always harder with smaller. You watch every single penny, you do all that kind of stuff. So I, there's definitely ways of doing that. But I sometimes, some of the other agencies, I'm like, what do you, why? Why is this so complicated? It's, it's, you're making it harder on yourself here. Yeah. And I think communication plays a big role in that, right? I think a lot of times, I think I, I'll, I'll see like business owners will, they'll underestimate their employees, right? They'll be like, oh, I, if I have that conversation with them, like, oh, the person will freak out or they'll leave or they'll do this or they'll do that. And it's kind of like, to your point, okay. well, you're the owner and you're the only one responsible here for the business's success. So like have that conversation, you know what I mean? Like, I, and just mm -hmm. like, they're an adult, you're an adult, you're a professional, they're a professional. I think a lot of times, in, so. <laughs> even in my experience where I felt like somebody wasn't, yeah, where I felt like somebody wasn't going to take something well, it turns out, you know, they really got it very clearly. They were like, okay, that makes sense. Or they were yeah, waiting that for that sense. conversation. Correct. They were yeah. really, really we waiting have that for that conversation, conversation right? a lot. Yeah. yeah. I have that I conversation have a lot. I do a lot of like open doors with the staff so that they can come kind of come and talk and make myself available because I'm detached from 
the production team a lot uh, on the, on the day to day mm -hmm. a lot. So I want to make myself available. And I had some of the managers or the directors come to me last week and they're like, I always read your, your notes from your one-on-ones with the team. And like, you get so much more out of them. Why do they speak so much more to you? And it's like, well, you've got to bring them something, right? Like if you, yeah. if you actually bring them a topic or bring them a conversation, they will engage. But if you just like sit back and go like, talk to me hey, about on? everything that's on your <laughs> mind. Like, first of all, developers right. and, and, and web people in general just aren't that extroverted that that comes naturally to them in general. And that is a generalization, but I've found that to be largely the case. And in our case too, we've got different cultures, right? We're distributed around the world. So, you know, not, not everybody may be comfortable, you know, just volunteering whatever is going on in, in their head. And so having that dialogue and bringing something to the table to those conversations is super important. And if you initiate, which is your job, because you are, you know, ab uh, above them or whatever on the org chart, you know, part of your responsibility is controlling communication and, and, and doing it well and setting an example of what good communication looks like so that when they go talk to somebody else in the organization, you know, they're following that, that, that communication approach, especially in distributed environments where I think that's, that's probably the most important, that's probably the most important thing that you can have to, to, to success <laughs> is really a good defined communication workflow. Right, right. Fair enough, sir. Well, we're, we're yeah. coming up on the, I think this is going to be the first episode, sir. I, we got some good topics out. The idea nice. for the show is going to be literally trying to do operations, figure out how to talk to people, how to do management stuff. And then we're going to try to interview some agencies because I think that's an important way of kind of learning, learning from other people. Yeah. I think, uh, I think owning and operating, you know, these, these businesses is it's, it's, super interesting and the the opportunities are are so large and and the topics are are super interesting so looking forward to it for sure yeah client services man <laughs> client services that's right fun times all right jason this was great we'll see you the next time you bet